Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Welcome to this special Bloomberg podcast about higher education in Britain. I'm your host, Caroline Hepke. The role of university in the world of today uh, isn't uh, essentially different from what it's always been. There are two things to be done, I think. One is to uh, act as a centre for the preservation of what is best in our civilization and culture. And the other is to uh, prepare people for tomorrow. That voice was the first Vice-Chancellor of Lancaster University, talking about the role of universities in the 1960s, when Britain was first experimenting with expanding higher education access for the very first time, and entirely at the expense of the British taxpayer. Fast forward 60 years and not much has changed in terms of the goals of higher education. In fact, the Conservative government over the past 14 years has been keen to tout the value of UK universities as one of the country's best assets. Part of these reforms, clamping down on low quality courses, will improve the overall financial sustainability of the system. And that's right. It's right for students, right for the taxpayer, and ultimately will build a better education system. University is about education, and we've got some world beating universities in our country, but we also want to ensure that students who go to university get good jobs, get good skills, um, especially with the investment on the student loan that they make. There's more destinations and options open to young people than ever before, and it's really good good news that your chance now of going to university if you're from a disadvantaged background you're 86% more likely to go to university than you were in 2010 so it's not an arbitrary figure like 50% it's very targeted on making sure that we do give that access to university we've got a constellation of first-class universities Uh, we've got one of the most vibrant dynamic diverse cosmopolitan multicultural funkopolitan capitals on earth And you'll come away with a really good degree and a really good education and you'll learn in the language that is the language of global communication. That was the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, typically exuberant, alongside Rishi Sunak and other Tory ministers. But UK universities are now facing an existential crisis. Stagnant fees and inflation are squeezing higher education institutions. The sector is losing valuable international students after the government clamped down on graduate visas. Well, joining me to discuss on this special University Challenge podcast is Bloomberg reporter Helen Chandler-Wild. Helen, great to have you with me. We wanted to do some special reporting around UK universities because they seem to be at a real kind of pivotal moment. But I wanted to just start with thinking about why the UK's universities are just so good. They're some of the oldest and the best in the world. And, you know, the UK politicians keep talking about them. Yeah, obviously, we had a massive head start when it came to higher education. We have literally had universities for a thousand years. That has allowed us to accumulate huge amounts of human capital. Mm. And also, we're some of the most trusted universities in the world and produce excellent research, but also very good teaching. And as a result, draw so many people here because our reputation is so strong. Yeah. And we were speaking also to the CEO of QS, which is a research organisation that ranks universities globally around the world. Jessica Turner sort of reflects on that point. Mm. Have a listen. UK institutions really are an absolute asset for this country. The UK has four universities in the top 10 globally and 17 in the top 100. And that is really a incredible position for the sector to be in. So that was the CEO of QS, Jessica Turner, who really understands where the UK is positioned versus the rest of the world. But there is also a real disconnect. I know that you've been speaking to a lot of students on this issue, Helen. Yeah, there is basically the fundamental issue with universities at the moment is we've moved from having them being a small selective Mm. place where only a very small percentage of people would come and then turning into now, which is it's almost a prerequisite for getting all kinds of jobs. So people are coming to universities. However, the funding is just not in place to support that many students coming. I say this as someone who's I've been paying my student debt for nearly a decade. I've paid £20,000. I still have £72,000 left to pay. Wow. It's astonishing amounts of money. So for that to be worth it for a student, you have to be having an excellent experience which a lot of students just aren't feeling 
and especially with more and more people coming there just aren't the facilities there so there's competition even to get a spot in the library in the morning because you can't sit down because there are so many students on campus mm. and at the sharp end of course university chancellors who are having to cut their budgets the financial pressure has been enormous because of course that fee that students are paying in the UK has remained stagnant for a decade I was talking to the warden of goldsmiths which is part of the University of London she's really talked about how there's been a, a crisis in terms of the funding and that the funding of humanities courses is really quite kind of perilous they're focused very much on arts and humanities courses have a listen to what she's said in terms of the funding she would welcome a big change in terms of government input but isn't convinced that it'll come here is professor francis corner you can cut your costs to be as viable as you possibly can but they but it doesn't necessarily mean you can withstand for the next 10 years so you've got to think about some other opportunities and there are an awful lot out there. How do we provide CPD? How do we provide upskilling of, of people? There are different ways of doing it rather than it being a three-year degree course. That's a responsibility that we can think of. You can't just keep salami slicing your, your way out of this. Helen, in terms of how many UK universities are really at risk, that seems to be the most important question at the moment, especially as we are in a general election year where we may get a new government and therefore new policy. Yeah, so a lot of this has been going on for a few years and a lot of universities have dealt with their financial problems in different ways. So some have shut departments, so gradually cutting down the number of subjects they offer to try and create some kind of economies of scale mm. in what they can offer for a lower price and closing some less popular courses while others like I looked at York in the piece that I've written and what they're doing is cancelling building projects to try and save money on built like not having new investment but just really focusing on keeping their costs down in the present when I was researching the piece I spoke to Paul Swinney who is the director of policy and research at the Centre for Cities and he talked about how this is not just an issue for students of universities but also for the cities that they're in because obviously see they're such a huge contributor to the economies there. It's definitely one of the most direct levers that policymakers can pull in terms of trying to improve the attractiveness and the performance of city centres. You know, trying to pull in private sector jobs is hard. But things like university buildings, those types of things are things that policymakers can move around. I think by putting them in the centre of, uh, of towns and cities, uh, it does generate that footfall, it does sort of change the feel of of, uh, of the place when you're walking uh, around it. So that was Paul Swinney then from the Centre for Cities. In terms of what you've been looking at in your work mm. around higher education, are there new ideas now coming in about how this could change, either to increase funding or to try to get students to pay more or to change the system within the UK? The newish idea, which has been used very heavily over the last few years, has been obviously relying more and more on international students to fill the gap in funding. So domestic student fees have barely risen and there's quite a tight cap on that to £9,250 a year for undergraduate fees. Whereas if you're an international student, it's the World West and they can charge you anything and sometimes they can be astonishingly high it could be like sixty thousand pounds a year uh, it's like american style university fees so obviously that's very compelling for universities to try and plug those gaps and that's now the model which is being used where basically one is cross paying for the other however obviously that's difficult when there are visa changes coming in and also it can be difficult because with high levels of immigration into these areas there needs to be more housing and facilities built which are also not being done yeah, so that's the kind of difficulty, but that's the model. Well, we were also speaking to Lord Willits, David Willits, who actually introduced that fee-based system that you're talking about. I mean, I was the last year that graduated. So annoying. Where there was <laughs> no fee, where university fees were effectively paid for out of you know centralised government funding. Willits actually told me that he quite regrets not being able to index fees to inflation at the time. Having said that, he also says that he doesn't expect a large number of universities to go bankrupt. The sector is certainly under pressure. Overall, it is still the case that they've got reasonable financial reserves, though those are diminishing. There are some special cases, there are some universities that people are looking at nervously that may be on the edge. Yes, so there are some specific risks plus a general financial pressure. So that was Lord Willits speaking to me. 
there's also the issue then of, of overseas students, which a lot of people do also feel has become very politicised and is also quite difficult and risky in many ways. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It is ultimately a political issue which affects so many different things. A lot of people I spoke to talked of it as just being an export of exporting a car, but it's not as simple as that because obviously it does involve people coming here and it touches many more areas of policy Mm. than just trade. And just on that note, in terms of the export nature of this whole industry, this is what uh, the QS CEO had to say. The challenge here for the sector is that this is an export sector for the UK, essentially. It's one of the top export sectors for the UK. A a target was set to have 600,000 international students by 2030. That target was met 10 years early, and the economic benefit to the country has been uh, immense. And yet the international student sector is really caught in a difficult debate. It's caught in a debate about migration, whereas actually students who come to the UK are temporary visitors. So then what might the solutions be for the sector? So the most dramatic solution, which a lot of people are moving towards, is just having fewer people go to university. Mm. So coming back to a position we were in in the 20th century. And the current government has pushed that a lot over the last few years with moving towards apprenticeships, which does seem to make more sense if you're taking on it's a very expensive to have this many people at university and if the students are finding it difficult to pay then perhaps it's just not worth it and other issues just might include just increasing student fees which personally i think is something that's pretty likely to happen just to cover some of those costs and i'm sure the universities will keep pushing to do more commercialization aspects as well whether that is opening up for more business having better links with industry Mm. or perhaps even just hosting conferences I think that is also personally very likely yeah I think that's also interesting given that the warden of Goldsmith for example just as one of those vice chancellors across the country having to think about being at the sharp end of that has been quite critical about how much political ambivalence there's been around how many people should go to higher education some of the discussions around do we want overseas students are we going to shut the graduate visa route, are we going to do this, are we going to do that, has undermined the recruitment of of overseas students. Um, And they are really important, as I was saying in the beginning, because of what they bring to the UK economy and also what they bring to our student body as well. Mm. She was telling me, should we be surely not aiming actually for universal higher education in the UK? If you think about the kind of skills economy that the UK needs, AI and all the changes that are going to come. Also, Lord Willits is one of those individuals who who has talked about their needing to be actually a package of measures, including an increase to fees. Have a listen. I see the, the solution is in, in two stages. I think as an absolute minimum, we need to start increasing the fees in line with inflation year after year. And of course, once again, getting across, this isn't money that students have to pay up front. Uh, this is a basis of a graduate repayment scheme. However, I think we probably also do need a step change up from 9,000, and who knows, by 1,000, 2,000 or something. And for that, there needs to be a wider settlement with whichever party is the new government. So David Willits there, whichever party is the new (laughs) government, uh, of course, he's a former Conservative Party minister and so very much the ball now potentially being in the court of Labour. I think it is... As I say, a very pivotal moment for higher education. A lot is riding on it. Politicians want to see a lot from it. And the UK desperately needs growth. It depends what kind of economy we're aiming for. And universities are really at the centre of that. If Mm. we do want to have a very skills, knowledge-based, very modern economy, universities will have to play a big role. But we do need to work carefully and think about how we're using them and not just expect them to be able to fund themselves in this situation. Yeah. Having said that, it's an issue that goes right back to where we started, the 1960s. The Vice-Chancellor of Lancashire University was thinking about this back then. In all of those decades, so much has changed about education, but not some of the fundamentals. It happens that at the present time, preparing people for tomorrow takes a great share of our total attention because the world in which we live is changing so very fast so that uh, people who enter their working life over the next few years may find that uh, their jobs have changed completely and the world in which they live has changed very greatly 
long before they retire. That was uh, the Vice Chancellor of Lancaster University. Hope we've managed to educate you a little <laughs> bit with this podcast. Helen, thank you so much for being with me this morning. You can read all of Helen Chandler Wilde's piece all about the challenges facing higher education in the UK on the Bloomberg website and on the Bloomberg terminal. That's it from us for today. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you very much. If you like this programme, you can subscribe and give it five stars so that other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen. This episode was produced by Tiwa Adebayo. Our audio engineer was Sean Guastamakia. I'm Caroline Hepke. We'll be back with more tomorrow.